happy to be here, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I just want to spend a few words talking uh, um, about where I'm coming from. I'm very pleased to see that the School of Engineering here is interested in environmental issues and sustainability issues. And so my background is uh, from the natural sciences. I was very interested in studying trees. So when I was back in Italy, I would go out on, in the forest and was interested especially in studying trees that, that, that were at the tree line. So that particular interesting line that where the forest stops and then you start having the mountain tops that are normally unvegetated. I was interested in trees because I, I like going in the forest and I was more, more of a sensorial thing than anything else. But uh, I was also getting more and more interested in devising ways to protect forests, uh, not just for the uh, benefits that they would deliver to individuals like me, but also for their, uh, the benefits that they deliver to society. Um, forests have uh, a very important functional role in the landscape in that uh, they can uh, trap um, waterfall and um, moisture for a long time. They can protect the aquifers. Uh, they protect the soil uh, from eroding and actually keep it in place and so that we don't have soil where we don't want to have it, like in the reservoirs um, or streams. Uh, and so uh, on top of that, you have endless opportunities for recreation and, uh, and wildlife habitats. And so while thinking of ways to actually uh, actively protecting forests, um, one thing that became more obvious was that conservationists were not particularly interested in those kind of uh, benefits and services. They were interested in conservation for the sake of conservation or conservation of biodiversity, which is a, a noble value to have and to hold, except not, um, not everybody in the world can sort of afford to care for, bi for biodiversity. Uh, I've been in a lot of developing countries where actually forests or marine ecosystems are heavily used because people depend directly on these resources. I've done work in Vermont where a lot of uh, landowners don't even go into their forests uh, because they don't need to cut the wood. Uh, they don't need to, um, to get resources from the forest. So uh, it seemed that a lot of the conservation work from many years was focusing on conservation for the sake of species. Uh, and uh, for as much as I agreed with that, um, I wanted to see a conservation that also cared about these other benefits that are of direct interest and direct benefit to human societies. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we had the economic system that actually was not caring about those benefits either. So it was another field way of looking at these benefits because they were entering, uh, a forest would enter the economic system only as a, a mere factor of production, as a, um, a series of materials, of raw materials that could be channeled and pumped into the economy to get some um, durable or less durable goods uh, in the economy. So there was this big gap. Uh, altogether, conservationists and uh, um, economists were doing, in, in a way, the same thing, ignoring some of these important benefits, and altogether ignoring uh, humans in, um, as full human beings who have needs, who have desires. So my talk today is going to be about the question of what if we treated nature as an economic asset? What, what would it mean for conservation science on one end, and what would it mean for the economic system on the other end? And so, altogether, I would like to set a little bit the context for the idea of natural capital that is the topic of, of the talk today. So basically, nature considered as an economic asset. Um, and then talk a little bit about challenges that you find uh, in the world of economics, but at the same time in uh, conservation science and other natural sciences, on how do we quantify this natural capital, these natural assets. Uh, on a monetary basis, uh, there seems to be a lot develop of uh, development there, but at the same time uh, in terms of biophysical measures uh, that can be used also for decision making and planning. And so a theme that is going to run across the, the talk is the implications for management in the end. So we should start a little bit from the economic side of things. And uh, I will just go back to the sort of the basic definition of uh, what economics is. And economics is the science of allocation of scarce resources 
among alternative desirable ends. And I'd like to just place a little bit of attention to these two things, scarce resources and ends, because there's been a lot of talks about these assumptions in economics. What are the scarce resources nowadays? What are the desirable ends? And so um, for a lot of people, uh, desirable ends uh, for economics, you might think, okay, it's a human welfare. It's we want to have well-being. Uh, in all the dimensions possible that you can think of, uh, meaning uh, having good jobs, having good health care, good education, safe environment, and safe uh, neighborhoods, and good friends, and all of that. Um, and, and those are all uh, noble goals. The question is that sometimes um, it, it seems that we are not always there on target on what the economy is for. It seems that economy uh, oftentimes is actually a lot about growing. And so this focus on growth that was shared by a lot of economists and certainly um, our slash your former president, Ronald Reagan, who thought that there are no great limits to growth because there are no limits of human intelligence, imagination, and wonder. Th definitely there's not such limits, but there might be implications that are different uh, when you talk about bringing the environment into the economic system. Uh, there's a lot of alternative views. This has been the sort of the mainstream, uh, very established way of doing business uh, in economics. But we are witnessing a wonderful plurality of views. And now more than ever, especially with the recent uh, recession and crisis, and with the whole talks about uh, um, austerity in Europe that I'm following very closely, being Italian, I'm always on the brink of uh, worrying very much about my country and other neighboring countries. So other views, for example, one that um, is very, very eloquent from uh, um, a colleague, Brian Czech, who's an ecological economist at, at CASI, the Center for the Advance Advancement of Steady State Economy, and he, for example, pictures the current situation as the economy is a, a runaway train and we are just shoveling fuel for something that is actually out of track, out of control. And then he has a, a line that if you can read that, uh, the book is about errant economists, shameful spenders, and a plan to stop them all. And so this is a very eloquent view of an alternative um, idea about what the economy uh, is uh, do, in moving towards. But at the same time, uh, here, Dartmouth is an interesting place also for uh, addressing this plurality of views, because here you also had uh, Donella Meadows uh, thinking about the limits to growth. And, uh, and so there is a tradition here. So it's a good place to be talking about this. And so another um, thing that we have to reconsider about that definition that I showed you of the economics is that of scarce resources. Traditionally, scarce resources for uh, the economic system uh, had been uh, the, the factor of production, essentially, so land, labor, and capital. And, um, and so land and labor, um, so on one hand, uh, historically, we have to think that some of these uh, factors of production might have been more abundant uh, than are now. And so, for example, we can think that in the very early times of the pre-industrial or early industrial uh, period, some of these factors were particularly scarce, like labor and capital, for example. And so this is a picture on the left of uh, uh, actually logging happening in New England. That was very disruptive logging, by the way. <laughs> You would not want to be one of those horses either, like um, on the verge of uh, falling down there. But anyway, so those were the times uh, when the economic theory was mostly designed for a system that was lacking the technology, was lacking the labor. Uh, nowadays, we are in a different situation. We are in a situation where we don't lack labor, and we don't lack the technology, we don't lack the capital. So here on the right-hand side, uh, this is actually harvesting a soybean in Mato Grosso in Brazil, and that happens on a regular basis. Um, a lot of forest is being converted to uh, soybean monocultures for biofuel production for exports, and also for feeding um, cows all over the world, actually. And so that's a different situation that we live in. Uh, likewise, in the marine environments, we are not scarce in uh, technologies and in ways to actually 
be very efficient at catching fish, uh, we are scarce actually in the fish stocks. And so here on the right hand side is uh, um, an image with the, uh, that shows the collapse of the uh, Atlantic cod. And uh, you can see a spike in the, in the uh, actually the fish landings in tons in the, around the 60s, and that's when we became more efficient actually f at fishing. So what I'm saying is that if we want to bring natural capital or nature into the economic system, we might have to review some of these assumptions that were based on a different world. And uh, revising this assumption, um, it's something that can be done. It's something that is okay to do. It's not something so revolutionary. And so therefore, we should pay a little attention to that. Um, one particular view that a lot of uh, ecological economists uh, are considering uh, in, t uh, in terms of revising some of these assumptions is that uh, the economic system is a subset of the global ecosystem. So instead of viewing the forest that I was talking about in the beginning of the talk as a mere um, factor of production, uh, considering the forest as the source of the timber, for example, uh, then the ecosystem becomes actually uh, the set in the place that contains e economies. And economies grow not in a void, but into an environment and a global ecosystem that has um, so much um, resources available and is able to absorb so much waste uh, in the productive process. So here I'm exemplifying, maybe I'll use this pointer. So I'm exemplifying the, uh, the global ecosystem as this green circle and inside the, uh, actually the economic system and matter and energy enter the system that get transformed into other matter and energy of other forms in the productive system, and there's some energy that gets lost. That's another important aspect, that a lot of uh, um, people who thought differently about the economy, they were interested in placing the economy um, under the laws of thermodynamics. There's, so there's certain matter that cannot be recycled back continuously, of course, as you well know. And so we call that entropy, heat, uh, uh, unorganized energy, you name it. Uh, and so we can assume, we can think that in the beginning of the uh, early re uh, industrial revolution, we were here in a so-called uh, empty world. And so where the size of the economy relative to the size of the global ecosystem was relatively small. But now we can see ourselves a little more closer to this situation where actually we are increasing the size of the economy to the point that some people uh, might think that it might be uneconomic to grow. And in fact, um, the question when is uneconomic to grow is when the cost of growing uh, outweigh uh, basically the benefits of growing. And some, so it's an important question of whether we are still in this sort of economic phase of economic growth. And so, but beyond just uh, revising some of the assumptions of the economic system, which is important to do if you want to bring natural capital and decision making and the accounting of, of economics, uh, you also have to make some of these concept, concepts more <coughs> operational. And so natural capital, uh, it's often defined as the stock of natural resources that produces ecosystem goods and services. So th those two terms, ecosystem goods and ecosystem services, is key. So um, we can think of ecosystem goods as the tangibles in, uh, in an ecosystem, something that you take from the environment and you directly use. That could be fibers for thatching a roof, or it could be water, soils. Um, so all those tangibles that um, easily enter the market and there are prices and demand for them. And so it's not so difficult to sort of track them into the economy, whether it's a formal or informal economy. What's more difficult to track in an economy uh, are ecosystem services. So all the functions, all the benefits that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, the things that are intangible, the fact that forests protect our aquifers, the fact that we have cultural opportunities like, uh, from uh, environments, like here, for example, in Romania, is a celebration uh, at the top of the mountains. They, they do on a regular basis in spring. 
and that's linked to their environment. At the same time, it's aesthetic beauty and things like that that um, cannot really easily enter the market because they are uh, not easily quantifiable, not easily made private or uh, uh, excludable from the use of, of, of multiple people. So there's been a lot of uh, work, a great deal of work, into trying to categorize, conceptualize these ecosystem services. It sounds like a sort of common sense kind of term uh, that you might not even uh, need to define very uh, precisely, but I can tell you that there's been uh, uh, at least a couple of decades spent on how to frame this idea of quantifying and categorizing ecosystem services. And one global effort that made a lot of difference uh, has been that of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment that published a big report in 2005 uh, in which researchers from all over the world basically tried to assess the state of natural capital. Where are we um, in terms of how many of these tangibles and intangibles from nature that uh, we receive. And uh, it was an alarming um, uh, result that they uh, share with the rest of the world. As you can imagine, um, if they basically a lot of these researchers in and, and the report uh, said that 50% of the ecosystem services um, were depleted or at least they were not uh, provided on a sort of uh, a reliable way and a healthy way. And so, but be beyond that level of sort of uh, generalization that we can have, there's a lot of interest, there's been a lot of interest in how to actually quantify ecosystem services. And one typical classical way has been uh, through monetary quantifications. Because you might imagine if you have a currency that is as convenient as a currency value, as a dollar, as a, uh, any kind of currency, that's much easier to use for incorporating into decision making. That uh, normally decision making, a lot of decisions are made based on cost benefit analysis. Does it cost uh, more to build, um, a, for example, a, a new development in a different area, in a given area? Does it cost more in terms of environmental benefits lost or less? There's a lot of this kind of, uh, uh, of conversation and uh, questions to be answered. So once, um, uh, as part of this, uh, this discussion on how to, uh, to basically categorize and, and list the ecosystem services, you can see there's been a lot of material at different levels, scientific uh, publications at the same time or lay audience publications. It is an example of sort of lay audience types in which you can see uh, a series of ecosystem services being listed uh, by each kind of uh, type of ecosystems. Uh, um, in, in a potential area. So for example, I just wanted to give you an example so that we know we are talking about the same thing. So for the marine ecosystem, for example, uh, ecosystem services uh, could be considered like food, some of the tangibles, climate regulation would be one very important one, nutrient cycling, so the cycling of, of the nutrients to the system and recreation opportunities. These are just examples that I wanted to mention and I almost forgot to mention. And so uh, going back to my flow of thoughts, it was um, this important publication that came out in 1997 in Nature that was uh, by a former director of the Gandhi Institute for Ecological Economics. And this paper, uh, first of all, it was important because something like this made it into a nature publication. Because nature didn't, was not used to publish things like that, of trying to price the planet. So this was a study that for the first time actually had tried the effort, almost uh, the impossible, of placing a dollar value on the resources, the tangibles and intangibles that we would get from ecosystems all over the world. And uh, um, it was a relatively concise publication. It, uh, there was a big table. This table is almost uh, not legible. There's a lot of holes where there's holes. Uh, it means that there's no data. For each of the major ecosystem types uh, in the world, or biomes as you want to call them, uh, there was the extent, the area was calculated, uh, estimated, and uh, at the same time, uh, a, ser a series of values, of economic values, were listed for each of the ecosystem services that were thought to be produced by each of these ecosystems. 
the values would come from resource economics uh, uh, publications, so a huge amount of literature um, was, uh, was analyzed to actually get access to some of these numbers. In the end, I don't really, nobody should really care about these numbers. But what is important is that was the first time in trying to categorize some of these ecosystem services and, and trying to put a, a dollar value on them. The major result of the publication was that overall, um, if we consider the man-made economy, the manufacturing economy, that would produce every year like $18 trillion. Uh, but if we compare by um, difference the, the nature-based economy, they would be actually generating $33 trillion per year. That doesn't really mean much. What do we do with these big numbers anyway? But it was the first time that someone actually tried the effort and tried to even place on the map some of these values. It was a publication that um, raised a lot of controversy, actually. And I remember at the Gandhi Institute, we had a binder where there was the, the publication from Nature was at the top, and in the rest of the binder, like 300 pages of follow-up material, of letters, of articles that disagreed, agreed on the methods. Some of the methods were not, uh, was, were not considered legitimate, or, but at the same time, uh, also the ethics of doing something like that. People would ask, I mean, why would you want to monetary value something that is, uh, you know, has intrinsic value in itself? And so, but for me, it's an important point because it's one of those publications that after that, you see the beginning of a whole field of research and you see the, you know, a spike in the publications in the years to come. And that's what, exactly what happened. And after 15 years of now, we have uh, a lot of the um, natural resource agencies in the US that actually use the same jargon. They have adopted the concept of ecosystem services and also some of the quantification methods. Then some other, another example of a, a very powerful uh, publication in that respect came uh, a little later, 2002, um, also in, in something very um, well reputed in, uh, publication in science. And what happened there was that let's try to apply some of these methods to actually show something that has more relevance for decision making. Like, for example, comparing, uh, like in this case, uh, management of mangroves. You, you can manage, manage a mangrove system for shrimp farming, or you can leave it intact. If you leave it intact, it has a whole set of ecosystem services that it produces that can be valued. And NPV stands for the uh, net present value, meaning the stream of flows, uh, the, the stream of costs and benefits that can occur over time as if they occur today. So it's a measure, basically, of um, a return on investment. And the question here, uh, is oftentimes, yes, the, you have more benefits here, uh, but at the same time, who's reaping the benefits altogether? Who is gaining from this? This, some, this money is not really uh, real money. Sometimes it's uh, an estimate that you give to an ecosystem that does enter the market in a way because there are no markets for these ecosystem services. So that's a big question of where, how we factor in actually uh, the beneficiaries of some of these ecosystem services. And along the lines of this work has been also my, my recent work uh, in Macedonia, in this case, uh, where I work with the United Nations Development Program um, over there to actually assess the net benefits of effective conservation um, in a wetland area that was located around uh, Lake Prespa. And uh, if this is Macedonia here, let me see if I can point it. Um, yes, here. So here's Macedonia, and then you have the intersection of these border lines between Greece and Albania, and basically Lake Prespa is exactly there at the intersection of those three border lines. And in fact, Lake Prespa is a, a transboundary lake. There's a lot of agreement uh, among uh, different uh, governments of the of the three countries to actually manage the area in a coordinated way and hopefully more sustainably. It's an area of great interest for birds. Uh, so it's uh, it's an on a migra migration route. There's a, a lot of bird diversity, but also very interestingly, these lakes uh, are very old lakes. Some of the older lakes, 
oldest lakes in, uh, in the world. These are tectonic lakes, and uh, so basically evolution had a lot of time to actually refine uh, its strategies, and there's very interesting um, fish species over there that you can find in these lakes. And one problem with the lake is that it's very shallow, and so it can heat up very quickly, and uh, there's not, so there's not much recirculation also of water. There's no outlet, there's no way out, there's no streams coming out. And uh, at the same time, there's been uh, local changes in the climate that have exacerbated the reduction of the level of water in this lake. So basically, this lake is, uh, in a way, set up for becoming easily polluted. And um, this is a shore area where actually I did most of my work. My, there's a current efforts to protect this reed belt uh, because it serves a little bit as a filter also for the whole watershed for inputs that come into the lake. What happens there along the shores of that lake is that there's a lot of apple production and uh, it's a very intensive monoculture, not much else is grown otherwise. And it's for the goal of growing very few varieties of not so much high economic value over there. And it's so important as a sector uh, for production that one of the municipalities even established uh, a monument to the apple in the middle of the of the town. And uh, I mean, it's not the most good, you know, best, the best looking monument, but it, it symbolizes that uh, there is definitely a, a value placed uh, onto something like that. The problem then with apple production is that it requires a lot of inputs. It requires a lot of fertilizers, pesticides. And at the same time, this is an area where there's, uh, there's no um, treatment of runoff water. But it, even uh, more importantly, the, the current streams in the area have been uh, re-engineered to actually go directly into the lake. So basically, the whole filtering uh, potential of the of the wetland there has been bypassed by the streams that actually discharge directly into the lake, and and so what happens over there uh, is that there is a, a high level, a high concentration of nutrients. If if you can think that uh, normally you have algal blooms happening at the concentration of a total phosphorus of 0 0.025 milli uh, milligrams per liter. And here, what we see, let's see if I can draw a line with this one. So we are really, this is 0 0.5 milligrams per, per liter. So we are way above uh, any imaginable limit of um, actually acceptable levels of phosphorus. So, so algal blooms are indeed uh, uh, occurring all the time, meaning that there's a lot of uh, toxic um, the toxic microorganisms that uh, are producing these toxins for that are very dangerous actually for also for human consumption uh, for human exposure and so I was talking about I was already leading into talking about consumption because uh, there's um, a lot of uh, concerns actually at the moment for uh, increased concentration of pesticides in fat tissues of fish over there because a lot of the pesticides uh, uh, used for apple production end up not just in the waters but uh, in the fish and so altogether is becoming a big a concerning issue so but it's not all um, doom and gloom here luckily there's a lot of initiatives that are happening in UNDP United Nations Development Program is really working to uh, to make things better and work with the farmers for example to to help them devise new ways to uh, to actually apply some of the fertilizers uh, or nutrients. And, uh, and also this example of, of my work uh, can help in the sense that we wanted to show that there is um, a benefit, a net benefit of actually managing some of this uh, ecosystem, this wetland uh, for uh, conservation, for producing some of these ecosystem services that was originally producing before a lot of the interventions were made. And so at the moment, uh, what I did was comparing the two scenarios, for example, and so using some of these uh, quantification, uh, monetary quantification of ecosystem services to compare a scenario of business as usual. What if we keep this wetland going as it is? In the end, it, was, it is 
um, a common access resource where people will actually get in and extract what they need. In this case, they need a lot of sand. You see here, so this is, they extract a lot of sand and because they use it for building, uh, so they use it for cement and uh, construction. And that's mostly it. And then there's other more negligible uses. And uh, there's, uh, you see, so there's fishing uh, and it's happening in that part of the lake and it's happening um, at um, actually a very limited level at the moment. Um, there is a little bit of a dysfunctional system over there for managing the fishery because they don't have an institution really in place. But it happens anyway. And so this was compared, actually, the, the benefits that were received uh, at the moment under, under business as usual were compared to the benefits of what would it look like if we effectively conserved this area. And effectively conserve it might mean also intervening to, for example, enhance the, the water filtering capacity of the wetland. And so one idea, for example, given that nutrients uh, and pesticides uh, are such a big concern, one idea would be to actually channel some of the wastewater uh, from a wastewater treatment facility into the wetland so that uh, it would be actually, um, so that some of these nutrients and, uh, and pesticides would be taken up and some of these toxic uh, materials would be taken up by the, uh, the vegetation in the wetland. And so there are costs obviously associated uh, with this view of uh, effective conservation. And most of the costs are not so much into the building of, uh, for example, of, of this, uh, uh, rechannelization, let's say, of the wastewater. Uh, but most of the spending at the moment goes into capacity building, for example, in uh, enabling these communities to actually handle conservation and be able to actually manage this area as a park. Uh, the, the big spike that you see here in red uh, is the benefit that you would get from nutrient abatement in the effective conservation scenario. And, uh, and so that was uh, to give you an example of uh, economic uh, calculation uh, est estimate of these benefits. Uh, we uh, looked at how much it would cost if you were to um, eliminate or reduce the amount of nutrients in the wastewater if you had to do it uh, in a man-made facility. And we, looked, we saw that it would uh, make the cost of uh, wastewater treatment basically uh, become triple the, uh, the amount that they are at the moment. One big missing piece, and this is a, a cost-benefit analysis that you can, as you can see, one big missing piece and a big question mark is what are the costs of uh, not doing anything? What are the costs of policy in action, basically? And this type of studies, this is a, a weakness that uh, a lot of environmental cost-benefit analysis have. It's this, what is the cost of actually uh, not uh, channeling some of the wastewater, for example, through the wetland? And this cost have, uh, can be enormous. Have, uh, there are implications for human health, as you can imagine. And so in substance, this methodology is not as sound as we wish it could be for this type of assessment. But altogether, even without uh, factoring in those um, those costs of the business as usual, if we compare the two scenarios, we still can get this information from these rough calculations that there are actually uh, effective, effective conservation um, benefits. Uh, you know, so the net benefits of actually investing in this kind of conservation uh, outweigh uh, the benefits of business as usual. So that has, they can have very important relevance uh, and implications for decision making. So, but um, the reason why I share this with you is also that I, I wanted to give you a sense of the applications of some of these methodologies, but it's not at all the time you really need to monitor, evaluate uh, uh, ecosystem services. In, in other times, you might just want to elicit some of the preferences that people have uh, by simply asking people uh, what would they prefer, how would they rank different options and things like that. Uh, another important way would be to actually measure some of these ecosystem services on the ground. And that's what I'm going to uh, talk next as part of my, um, my uh, talk today, so the rest of the time. So in particular, there's a, a growing interest 
in uh, decision support systems or, or mechanisms, computer-based uh, approaches to actually quantify and map some of these ecosystem services. And, and this can also be very relevant for um, decision making that is spatially based. So like planning, for example, planning for different purposes. And so for a few years, I've been the coordinator of the ARIAS project. ARIAS stands for Artificial Intelligence for Ecosystem Services. And I just want to share with you the, uh, the link over there so you can actually um, learn more about the project itself. This is a project that was funded uh, by NSF, National Science Foundation, in 2007, and with the idea of developing uh, a decision support system that would help mapping and quantifying ecosystem services. And altogether, uh, it was developed uh, mostly at the University of Vermont, and a lot of the development at the moment is happening also at the Basque Center for Climate Change. And uh, it was designed since the beginning with the idea that it could empower non-governmental organizations to actually act on the ground and, uh, and work with governments and uh, local organizations to actually uh, map and quantify ecosystem services. Some of these partners um, have been very important for the project, like Conservation International, and um, Earth Economics is a small uh, NGO based uh, in, uh, uh, in Washington State that does a lot of uh, economic valuation of ecosystem services. And so, and also we, had, we received funding from United Nations Environmental Program and uh, World Conservation Monitoring Center. And so what, uh, what the system does is, is a, basically a modeling platform that allows for different modeling uh, paradigms and, uh, it, and it enables modeling the source of ecosystem services and who benefits from ecosystem services and the flows from the point of source to the point of, of usage. And I'll talk more about that. I just want to um, show you in the world where uh, applications have been uh, done for this technology. And so you can see that, for example, uh, some very original initial work was done in Madagascar at the national level uh, to map out uh, carbon sequestration over there or sediment regulation in subsistence fisheries and coastal protection. And, and so forth, so we had several applications. One local one that we had in Vermont was about mapping the carbon sequestration potential uh, in uh, forest and agricultural lands and recreation as well. And the, the red dots are developing projects at the moment that are starting right now. And one that has been just completed in Ontario. And um, so the whole idea um, about trying to quantify and mapping ecosystem services that you have to conceptualize in a way um, that actually uh, it make, it makes it easier for a machine to actually go uh, measure these things and map these things uh, spatially. So first of all, you have to uh, get really, really into the nuts and bolts of what it means to have uh, an ecosystem that provides something, uh, a tangible or an intangible, to people. And so people and users become essential in this whole envisioning of, uh, of ecosystem service mapping, quantification. So in that respect, you can conceptualize uh, the delivery of a service uh, coming from a point of source, and there would be away from this ecosystem service. Think, for example, uh, water supply is an easy one to actually conceptualize. There would be a point where water supplies starts, uh, an ecosystem that is actually keeping trapping uh, water or a spring, and then you have a delivery channel, so it, it would probably flow in the landscape somehow, and it would reach over time different users that are located in different parts of the landscape. And so this is a very simplified, uh, obviously, um, conceptualization of what really happens. And, but for each ecosystem service uh, in the areas modeling paradigm, we have to come up with uh, uh, an idea of what is it that 
transfer the ecosystem service from the point of source to the point of where it's used and where it's enjoyed. And so we were talking about carriers and flow paths of ecosystem services. And to give you an example, I just mentioned water, water supply. So for hydrological services, you would think, uh, for example, uh, water flowing from a, a higher altitude towards the um, lower altitudes in a watershed. And so hydrological services uh, would, meet, would be mapped in, as flow of water in this case. And uh, uh, the important thing that uh, was added to the whole concept of ecosystem services was this dynamic component. So it's not just a matter of a source and a point where the, um, the ecosystem service gets used or enjoyed, but there is also a movement. So how do we capture that movement? So the movement was captured uh, through agent-based modeling, and the source and, and the point of source and the point of usage were actually uh, captured through Bayesian networks and probabilistic modeling that was done. And uh, the reason why there was an emphasis on uh, probabilistic modeling was that uh, not all the time you have data for all of the areas that you try to model and to, uh, where you want to quantify these services. And therefore, we wanted the system to be able to actually run also in data scarcity situations. And so that is, um, of course, uh, one choice uh, that, that was uh, um, heavily discussed in our group. Other groups have developed other tools, for example, that are not probabilistic, and they indeed use deterministic modeling. To keep going with the examples, uh, another ecosystem service that was modeled as part of the system is the aesthetics of, uh, of a vista, of a view, for example. And so we would call it the static view shed. And uh, what we modeled here was the movement of the, uh, of the site, basically, of the uh, lines of sight, uh, so that your view would travel along those lines of sight to the beneficiaries located in the surroundings. And uh, we also modeled carbon. The carbon is a completely different ecosystem. Carbon sequestration is a different uh, ecosystem service in the sense that it d really doesn't travel in itself, and it's, uh, there is a quick mixing in the atmosphere of this gas. So we don't have that sort of dynamic component for this ecosystem service. Recreation, uh, the, the movement of the benefit was modeled uh, as a Gaussian cor curve. And so here is an example of uh, Central Park. And you would enjoy um, Central Park the closest you were to it, and so forth. So another example would be using a network of uh, so an infrastructure of roads, for example, for some of the goods that travel throughout this road, uh, through these roads to reach their final markets. And so the modeling of uh, ecosystem uh, service source, the point where it originates, is done uh, through uh, building Bayesian models. And I'm not going to go too much into the details of Bayesian models because I am not one of the developers in, in this case. So, but uh, for sure, so the source models were modeled including variables that had to do uh, with the geology of a place, or the, uh, or, or for example, the ecological characteristics of the place. In this case, we are, I'm showing an example of uh, actually a simulation that tries to estimate uh, the tons of sequestered carbon in this area that is in Washington state. And so, for example, in the case of, uh, of carbon sequestration, you would have uh, variables such as uh, biomass production or the succession stage of, uh, of a forest, and uh, the soil types, uh, because, of course, we would model also uh, carbon in the soils. And, um, and so here, it's not, again, these are biophysical units, so we are not using monetary units at all. In fact, here uh, are tons of sequestered uh, carbon. My English is deteriorating, uh, well managed. Uh, so um, we also, as I said, uh, one important thing for us was uh, um, that the model would be probabilistic in nature to be able to, to track uncertainty across the landscape. And so here an example of how to map uncertainty in the data. Uh, uncertainty can come uh, from different sources, could come from not having all the data that you need, not all the information that you need to actually uh, start with your models. And so one thing that is possible is actually to give the users the ability to decide themselves, is this something 
uh, is this a level of uncertainty that I can accept? Do I need to have better data to actually improve my models? And uh, the other side that we, we looked into is, was the beneficiary side. This is a sort of, a, in a way, revolutionary concept in the sense that, as I said in the early part of my talk, beneficiaries or people, users, have traditionally been excluded both by conservationists and economists. And so here we place a lot of uh, emphasis on actually locating those beneficiaries. Who is benefiting? Where are they? What happens if we interrupt some of the flows? Um, if we deplete some of the services that they don't reach the beneficiaries anymore? So basically uh, the, the current modeling allows to map out where the, the demand for some of these services is. In this case, uh, we are mapping out uh, local farming communities and how much they depend on uh, soil deposition or soil erosion. And so just to give you an example of how it looks like um, in, an, in an areas application. Areas, as uh, you might have guessed from some of these uh, pictures, is actually run online. So it's a modeling platform that runs online. You can select areas of applications and receive the, res uh, the results of the simulations on the fly, basically online. And uh, most importantly, and this is the thing that I would like to give uh, definitely more focus uh, of all, is when you run the, the flow models uh, in areas, basically the agent-based modeling uh, that simulates the movement of the ecosystem service to the landscape from source to usage, uh, then what you can do is identify critical flow paths of, uh, of movement of the benefit and identify areas where they concentrate. And so in this case, this is an example of a simulation of the aesthetic view actually, again, in Washington State, because that's one of our first uh, case studies in the, in the project. Here is Mount Rainier. And uh, so what are the sort of the, the hot spots uh, for some of these critical flows uh, to reach the area? And once uh, you map out those hotspots, it's very important from uh, um, a decision-making or planning point of view because it can help you plan around those areas. So this may be an area where, okay, it's more suitable for development and it, it's development here might not impact as much the flow of the service. While if you, if you end up developing in this area, this can have important consequences actually on the enjoyment and the, or the use of a given ecosystem service. And applications along the line uh, are, for example, the ones uh, that were requested to us from the oil and gas sector. So some, for some reason, there's increasing interest from the corporate world in actually tools that can map and quantify ecosystem services. And one sector particularly uh, is the oil and gas who's interested in that. And here is an example. If you map out those critical flow areas, those areas that you shouldn't touch, because in this case, for example, uh, I'm showing an, an, an example of an application with water supply. So let's uh, assume that these are area of high critical flow for water supply services. So if you were an oil company that needs to develop uh, a pipeline and you would want to try to avoid these areas, you might incur in higher cost uh, uh, of having a very long uh, pipeline. But in reality, what you can do in the area system is also plan different scenarios. What if instead I, I build something different and re I rerun uh, the model to actually see what happens if I use a shorter pipeline and, uh, and where, what happens to my critical areas of flows? And if I am of, uh, I'm impacting some of these critical areas, maybe I can offset some of these impacts by uh, reforesting in other areas. And so that's a little bit the concept and the flavor that I wanted to give you. And one last slide, and that's so that we have a little bit of time for questions, is that um, the modeling platform, the system, has also abilities to actually incorporate uh, externally developed global scenarios of uh, change, for, for example, like climate change. That's a big application that is happening nowadays on seeing, for example, uh, the impacts on climate change, of climate change on food uh, uh, production systems. And so, so that is something that can be dealt with uh, within the technology itself. And uh, scenarios, another way to deal with scenarios is also that you can flexibly 
select different areas and uh, so different spatial scenarios. So I'm interested in this area, but what if we lose, for example, this part of area to a development, to a fire, or anything else? What happens if we calculate total ecosystem service um, quantities for this area versus the, f the full area, area, for example? And, and in the end, uh, you're able to save all these scenarios and compare them um, all together and get a better sense of what options are there for actually uh, informing your decisions. And so I just wanted to give you a sense of some of the applications, uh, not just in the monetary quantification, but also the biophysical quantification that you can do and the need for uh, an emerging interest in such technologies uh, in different contexts. Uh, in this, for example, there is demand for this type of work, uh, not just uh, in the academic world, but NGO world, but also, the, as I mentioned, the business sector, but also the government sector. So a lot of the, the data that uh, EPA, for example, has been collecting over the years uh, from ecological data, they are being sort of translated into data that can be easily used uh, for assessments of ecosystem services. And I would like to stop here so that we have some time for questions. Thank you so much for your attention. So yeah, well, this is a, a good point. This would relate more, I would say, uh, to the monetary valuation. So not so much the biophysical valuation. But uh, indeed, there is a high level of subjectivity, as you can imagine. And uh, so especially some uh, economic valuation techniques actually are meant to be uh, eliciting actually subjective measures. So you would have actually surveys, for example, uh, in asking people what their willingness to pay would be for a given benefit or a given service. And you can imagine that is highly subjective and is not easily quantifiable uh, in other terms. But then uh, a lot of studies have been done also to measure the kind of lev uh, the level of subjectivity. And one interesting um, thing that emerged is that some of the uh, the perception of values would be influenced by even how the interviewer, the person who was asking about these values, would be dressed or are approaching the questions. If you had someone very well dressed, like um, you know, like in a business suit, uh, you know, people would be sort of willing to pay more for uh, protecting a given service. And so, so yes, it, you just centered it exactly at the core. <laughs> but, but luckily there are many methodologies actually that are not so subjective. And so I normally, depending on the, on the context, I try not to rely too much on the willingness to pay, for example. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And so where to draw the line? Well, in reality, it's uh, sometimes it's the application or the project that dictates or some sort of this, the scope of the analysis. And so uh, in the case, for example, of Mount Rainier, uh, it, it, it was thought for an application where uh, 
it could, uh, you could devise a new way to doing taxation or incentives actually for avoiding uh, the depletion of the aesthetic uh, service, right? And so in that case, you would work directly with the community there and looking into the, uh, the actual property values in the areas, how would they be affected by changes uh, that would deplete that aesthetic service and things like that. So it, it, in that case, yes, it, it's, it's huge and uh, you would want to invite to the table you know, all the people that are, are part of it and then they have a stake, so the whole idea of the stakeholder community. And so I have sort of uh, steered away from uh, valuation work or assessments that um, have this risk of, be of becoming, uh, of having, not being able to draw that line, so, so to speak. And so that's, that was the problem with the early valuation example that I, that I mentioned at the global level. What does it mean and whose values are we talking about? Can we actually generalize? Uh, a lot of the work that has been done uh, sometimes is if people don't have the resources to do an economic valuation on the spot, they actually would retrieve values from other studies and try to apply those values to that particular uh, study where for which there's no data and in the whole process you get a lot of lost in this translation basically and so you you have to do a lot of have to make a lot of assumptions of uh, you know comparability between the systems and so I, I totally completely agree with you in that risk yeah Thank you very much, Martha. Anyone would like to read the Thank you, guys. Thank you.